very excited to spend some time on a really interesting uh, topic when uh, the folks from Kinetics brought it to us, so we're happy to have them come and talk about it. It's certainly something that I'm interested in. It sounds uh, like it could impact a lot of businesses and there's not a lot of information out there. So um, we're happy to have you guys all here. So I'm going to pass it over to Paula uh, from Kinetics who will um, lead this seminar. So, thanks, Paula. Hello. Hi. Hi. So my name is Paula. I'm the president of Kinetics Media Communications. Kinetics is a 12-year-old online marketing agency and video production company. We're based here in Burnaby. And today what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about the CASL, the Canadian Anti-Spam Law. So CASL, what is it? You guys might originally have heard of this as Bill C-28. Did anybody hear anything about Bill C-28 at all? Okay, so Bill C-28 was Canada's anti-spam legislation that, uh, that went through Parliament. It was passed into law in December of 2010. So with typical speedy due process, we expect that it will come into force sometime in 2013, probably towards the end of 2013. What happens? Well, once, once the law was passed, um, it needed to go through Senate review, and then it needed to go through regulatory review. And there are two bodies that will be publishing regulations that businesses will have to follow about this particular law. The CRTC has already finalized their regulations and they are live on the CRT's website. Katie will be handing around, um, after the initial presentation, a resource sheet for you that has all the URLs for that information so you'll be able, you'll be able to find it. Um, CRTC's regulations have already been published. The CRTC has also volunteered to manage the spam reporting center. So if someone complains that you're a spammer, they will actually be reporting directly into the CRTC, who will then uh, begin an investigation. So that part has been settled. Industry Canada's regulations are not yet final. They published their first draft of the regulations in March of this year, um, and then invited comment they revised the regulations based on that comment, published a new draft, and have invited comment. That process has finished. A bunch of different organizations, including the Internet Advertising Bureau, the Direct Marketing Association, some other industry associations, have submitted written comment that they have agreed to have published, and those are all available on fightspam.gc.ca, which is the government's official um, CASL uh, information website. Industry Canada is reviewing the comments that came back, and they're going to amend the regulations and then finalize them. Once Industry Canada's regulations are finalized, that becomes the set of obligations that we as business owners are legally required to make sure happen. And at that point, the government will decide the enforce date, the date that we actually all have to start obeying this new law. Um, so best guess, sometime in 2013, probably later on in the year. Um, the regulations are really vague. If you've done any research online, and that, that's the thing that keeps coming up, is that the lack of clarity around what, what terms mean and what the definitions are is frightening because it's very much open to interpretation. And so what we're hoping for is that the final regulations clean up some of that um, inconsistency, some of that questionable language that's there. There are also some provisions in the, um, definitely in the original regulations that were a bit onerous, particularly for text messaging and, and mobile messaging. We're hoping for a little bit of leniency there <coughs> and pull back on some of the requirements. Having said all of that, it's still important that as business owners we're paying attention now and we're beginning to start to look at our practices now and begin to get them into compliance because if we don't, I think that's when we're going to get hit because we'll realize that it's pretty onerous and it's going to impact the operation of our business. And by the time we do, it's going to be too late to do anything about it. So that's the history. Why do we have it? Canada is in fact the last of the G8 nations to pass a law against spam. We're a little late to the party. We've enacted it for the same reason for can spam everything else, to, to try and limit the amount of unsolicited junk mail that we all get in our inboxes and other electronic messages. To make up for being the last guys to the party, we have enacted what is considered by some to be the toughest anti-spam law to date. The penalties that we're facing are huge in Canada. 
to give you an example, it can spam is the American law. It was one of the first anti-spam uh, legislations to be passed. It's been in force for, I think, six years now. The American law is an opt-out law. It says if you mail to someone, you're more than willing and able to do so if you have their email address in a regular business transaction kind of a way. But if they opt out, you've got to stop. The Canadian law is an opt-in law. It says, if you don't have permission, don't mail. There is no permission after the fact. The largest penalty that you can be enforced under can spam is $16,000 US. That's the stiffest hit you're gonna take. The stiffest penalty you can be enforced under uh, CASL, $10 million. Apparently they think that that's a deterrent. They're, they're hoping that the fact that if somebody um, breaches the law that the stiffness of the penalty will be a deterrent. That's not the real hook though. With the American law and with most of the other anti-spam <laughs> laws that are out there, the corporation is liable. With the Canadian law, the corporation is liable. So are the directors of the corporation, the officers of the corporation, the, anyone who employs someone who breaches the law is liable for the activity of that employee. Agents and mandatories of the corporation are liable as well. Let's take a look at a scenario. We're an email marketing agency. We every day go to work and we send email out on behalf of our clients to lists that they've provided us that they tell us are permission lists. If a client of mine breaches CASL, and we hit deploy on that message to that list and it's found that that client has breached CASL. I'm liable, personally. My business is liable. The owner of the company that we're working for is personally liable. If it's a public company, their directors and board of directors are liable. And the employees could be held personally liable as well. So the, the penalties are pretty wide reaching and pretty extensive. If you can show due diligence, you can show that you've taken the necessary steps to do the best that you can to prevent a breach of CASL, personal liability does not exist. So you're only personally liable if you don't do anything about it. As long as you do something about it, you acknowledge it, you put processes in place, you're protecting yourself. So that's the first big message that I really want you guys and, and business owners in general to hear, we're all feeling pretty comfortable, right? Anti-spam legislation's been around for a long time. Email marketing's been around for a long time. We think we understand permission. So we feel pretty comfortable that we're okay. The reality is that there are specific things we need to do with this new Canadian law to make sure that personally we're okay and that we're following um, the requirements of the regulation. CASL applies to all kinds of commercial electronic messages, no matter what they are. It applies to all of them. Anybody want to take a stab at defining a commercial electronic message? It is any message sent for a commercial purpose, definition pending, but any message sent for a commercial purpose, whether that message be text, voice, sound, or image-based, through an electronic channel to an electronic address. Voicemail, email, text message, instant message, anything of that nature. It, the, the definition has deliberately been written to be vague enough to encompass any future electronic communication that we come up with. So it's not just email that's affected. Today we're going to focus on email because we don't have a lot of time, but it's all of your electronic communication that you're operating through your business. There are some exceptions. If you send a commercial electronic message to someone with whom you already have an existing personal or family relationship, then you don't need permission. So you can market to your spouse and your kids <laughs> and your best friend all you want to. You can send a commercial electronic message in response to an inquiry. So if somebody actually calls you or emails you and asks for information about your services, you are legally allowed to respond. Isn't that nice? It's good. Um, you can uh, send an electronic message if someone has requested a quote or an estimate. You are legally allowed to respond and provide that quote or estimate by electronic means without first getting their written permission that you can do so. 
You can do it if the message facilitates an ongoing transaction. So things like receipts, shipping notices, that sort of thing are now um, protected. You don't need permission for that. You can do it if it relates to a warranty recall or a security issue. So if your car is recalled or can let you know, get your car to the dealership, whether you, they have your permission or not. If it relates to information regarding your employment or your benefits program, it's exempt. So you can terminate your employees by text message. And there may be some other issues, but it's not a CASL breach. Um, and also if it has to do with the delivery of a product or service. So for example, a software download, the email that says here's the link to download your software, or the email that says here's the link to download your ebook. That's an okay message to send without going through the, the requirements of permission at the beginning. The key thing to remember is that CASL applies regardless of where the message originates. If it lands in the hands of a, a resident of Canada, if it is accessed from a system within Canada, then this law applies. So it doesn't just apply to Canadians, it applies to people marketing to Canadians. If you run your program from a server in the States, still applies, we still gotta um, manage uh, our CASL obligations. It also rega applies regardless of the expectation of profit. So nonprofit associations, government bodies are covered. The Board of Trade is obligated to follow this rule regardless you know, of, of the expectation of profit from the program. It includes the installation of computer programs. So your Java update, your Firefox update, your Microsoft Office update, all of that um, installation, now you must gain specific permission to do that, to make modifications to a user's computer. So if any of you are in the software business, it's really going to affect your business model and, and how that works. Um, and certainly it's going to affect a lot of the free business models that happen. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of American companies are paying very close attention to this new legislation. If you're Facebook, if you're Twitter, you're putting an app on somebody's phone, your mobile website, if you have anything that you're installing on somebody's iPad and you want to update that, all of that now is covered under this permission law and, uh, and legislation. So that's the what it is. What are the requirements? Well, the first thing to know is that permission applies only to the channel that it was given in and explicitly for. So you need to get permission from your customer base to market to them, to communicate with them electronically for each individual channel. So just because someone says, yeah, go ahead, you can email me, doesn't mean you can send them a text message, doesn't mean you can reach out to them on LinkedIn, doesn't mean you can reach out to them on Facebook. You have to get permission on a per channel basis. It's an opt-in law. They must explicitly opt-in. It increases the number of steps that you're required to take. And it sets out what permission looks like. It defines what consent is. So there are two types of consent that are, are acknowledged, implied consent and express consent. So let's take a minute and let's talk about implied consent. Implied consent means that in the course of our relationship, things have happened that suggest or imply that I am willing to accept marketing or commercial messages from you. And the law is very specific about what those things might be. Implied consent always has an expiry date attached to it, and the expiry date varies based on the type of implied consent that you're mailing under. So one of the first things to think about is the software that we're using now for our, for example, email marketing, does it have the ability to put an expiry date on a record? Can we flag a record for automatic deletion or suspension after a certain date unless conditions are met? How are we going to manage that? Implied consent happens if you have some kind of commercial transaction. Now, a commercial transaction doesn't mean necessarily that I need to have purchased something from you in the past. It just means that we need to have engaged in some kind of commercial relationship. So if we were part of an agency that you guys had come and bid on your work and there were you know half a dozen of us, well, each of those half a dozen agencies has had some kind of commercial transaction with you. If you've had an investment opportunity or a gaming opportunity with an individual within the past two years, 
and that's the expiry timeline. So from the, from the point of contact, from the point of transaction, two years out, you have implied consent. Two years and one day, if you mail that person, you're breaking the law. At any time during that period, if they opt out, you must honor that opt out process, which we're all pretty used to. The other type of implied consent that exists is if there has been an inquiry made within the last six months. So anybody who calls you up and says, hey, I've got an air conditioning problem and you know, can you have somebody call me and they give you their phone number and their email address, you've got six months to turn that person into a member of your list, a permission member of your list. After that point, you can, you can mail them unless you've gotten explicit consent. Or if, if you have, purchase something. Or if they purchase something, then it goes to two years. Yeah, good point. If you have a written contract that is active or the expiry date, termination date of that contract is within the previous two years. So if there's any kind of contractual arrangement, same thing applies. And the fourth type is if an individual has conspicuously published their email address or their contact web address, whatever channel you're using, or has disclosed that address to you, and they have not included a disclaimer for that address, that they aren't giving you permission at the time that they disclose it or in the place of disclosure, and the message that you're sending is relevant to their role or function within their business. That's kind of a confusing one. Basically what it means is if you have your email address published on your website and it's there, then it's open season for anyone to market to you relative to your role in the business. So if you're a business owner and on your contact us page it says contact Joe at Envirotech, guess what? Joe at Envirotech can be marketed to as long as it's relevant to your role as the owner of the business. Unless you put a, this address not to be used for unsolicited, whatever, CEMs. So there's, there's that. The nice part about it is if somebody gives you their business card at a networking event, you have the legal right to follow up because of, of the law. Now the original requirement was that permission had to be gained in writing. That's been relaxed. It's now, the regulations are saying, okay, permission can be granted orally. You can meet someone at a networking event, have a conversation with them. They can tell you, yeah, go ahead and email me and, and that qualifies. However, the obligation is on the business to prove that consent was obtained. So if the guy that gave you his business card doesn't remember the conversation, it's a bit of a challenge. So again, there are processes that need to be put in place to document the where and the when of, of conversation. Express consent, you need to jump through some hoops as well. When you gain express consent from somebody, the first thing you have to do is disclose the reason for the communications that you'll be sending them. So you can, you can get somebody to opt into your newsletter. They haven't given you permission to send them promotional blasts. This is a big one for a lot of companies because a lot of companies, what, what happened, we started out sending newsletters and we sent newsletters every month and then business owners started looking at it going, oh, my open rates are really high, my click-through rates are really high, but damn, that is a lot of money I'm spending writing content. I did not get into business to be a publisher. This isn't doing, I don't want to spend this money and started transitioning programs and, and over, especially over the last five years, we've seen a lot of newsletter programs transition to being more blasts and offers. And so instead of a monthly newsletter, we send out a monthly offer. You know, save 10% save on your windows, 20% on your order over $150, free shipping, whatever it is, it's an offer. There are strategic reasons why that's not a great idea, but now there are legal reasons why that's not a great idea as well. Because if you promised a newsletter, you must deliver a newsletter or nothing. You can't just switch the program over without going out and re-establishing consent for the promotional program. There are some things that we'll be able to do to work around that as we set the programs up, but that's how the law um, is set up. The other thing that you need to, yeah. You can have a newsletter with offers. Sure. You can have an example of that that you're able to Absolutely. see and sign up, right? As long as what you deliver is what you disclosed at the time of consent, you're good to go. That's one of the ways around it. You can also make sure that in your consent statement, you, t you mention that you will deliver both newsletters and, and 
the odd off or however you want to word it. I mean, it'll be different for each company. The other thing you need is the recipient's name. How many of you have an opt-in on your website right now that asks for just email address to sign up for your newsletter? I know we do because it's a best practice. The less information, I mean, we've been telling people for years, the less information you have to ask for, the better. Best practice, ask for only what you need to deliver the service. And hand spam, by the way, makes that a requirement. Ask for only what you need to deliver the service. So newsletter, maybe just email. You can get away with just email address. And, and definitely, I mean, on our website, right at the top there, it shows just email address. Well, now we must have name. We're not done. We also need the mailing address of the individual to whom we're marketing. Or business address? It could be the business address, absolutely. Yeah, if, if you're marketing to someone within their business role, then their business address is, is the mailing address. But is starting to sign up for a newsletter starting to sound a little bit onerous? You know? Yeah. What's your name? What's your email address? Where do you live? You know, have a background check, too? <laughs> <laughs> well, for commercial operations, if you have an email address and a name, you have everything. That, that's true. That's true. Yeah. So now the question is, does it have to be disclosed at the time of opt-in? And this is where the regulations start to get a little fuzzy, right? What is it exactly that we need to have? And is it viable to ask for that? Um, so there's, there's that component. You must have an electronic address, phone, email, IM, whatever it is. And at the time of collection of the email or whatever contact information it is, you must make a statement that the individual opting in they unsubscribe or opt out of the communication flow at any time. If that statement isn't made, null and void. Permission does not exist. So those are the conditions that we need to be meeting when it comes to uh, permission. And definitely the address requirement. I mean, some of those things are things that are being covered under the, the responses to the regulations and the submissions because the reality is people opt in for communications a lot of times relative to their role, independent of their business function. A lot of people will opt in for a newsletter program or an information program because they're in a particular industry. If you're in refrigeration and you move from company A to company B, your interest in refrigeration doesn't change. So you may actually have opted in under your personal address to maintain that communication so that you don't have to go and update every time you, you, know, you change jobs or what have you. What address matters? Your business address? Your it gets a little murky. So we're hoping for some clarity there. When you send a message, no matter what that message be, no matter what kind of message that be, you must disclose your business name or your personal name. So the person or the individual on whose behalf the message is being sent. And that originally had to be an individual. That's been pulled back. They now agreed that if I'm sending messages for my company that I can actually use my company name. I don't have to use my, my name because I'm hitting button. Um, the physical mailing address, so your, your business address needs to be there. And you must have a functioning and easily instigated unsubscribe mechanism. And that's better than the original. The original uh, regulation stated that you must have a unsubscribe mechanism that could be completed automatically within a maximum of two clicks from, and it was very, very prescriptive. Now you just need to have, um, you have, you need to have that mechanism. And every message must give people the option and the instructions on how they're going to opt out. So those are the highlights. Those are the key things that we need to keep in mind. As a business, what does that mean for us really? Well, the first thing that businesses need to be doing right now today is stopping and saying, okay, what kinds of electronic communication are happening in my business that are covered under this new law? Let's do an audit. Let's get, a, let's get it all together. How many of you guys have a sales team that's using Salesforce.com? This one. Anybody using anything else? High Rise or Sugar or Zoho, anything like that? Maximizer, Act? Act. Okay. Sales guys can send email messages through that to their customer lists. Those messages are now covered under CASL. So a lot of times you'll have a sales team that's going out and they're sending messages. And you think, well, it's okay, right? Because they're all our customers, we have a relationship. Do you have a process in place to make sure that every single time a salesperson sends an email message, they include an unsubscribe mechanism, they include your mailing address, your company information, all of that in 
in the message? Is that process in place? What are the processes for synchronizing the data in your Salesforce account or whichever um, CRM you're using with your email marketing software? How are we synchronizing that data? What are our processes for making sure that we get the unsubscribe information from one database into another and, and, and back again? That we're making sure that we're honoring those requests. So if I unsubscribe from I don't know, say Constant Contact or MailChimp, or if you're working with us, buy and subscribe from your email software. The sales guys can't send me messages anymore if that's covered under the same permission statement. So we need to start aligning the permission statement. So that's the first thing is really thinking about what are all of the ways that we communicate on a, on a mass basis. And, and I should be really clear, CDSL doesn't specify mass communication, it specifies commercial electronic message. So. With can, I mean, some of the things that, that guys would do with can spam, you know, well, it's a one to one communication. It's on a template, and I pull it and I'd send it one person at a time, so it's a one to one communication. Mm -mm. It's a commercial electronic message, regardless of the size of the recipient list. So, um, that one of the things that has happened with Canada having waited as long is that it's watched, our government has watched what happened in other countries and what some of the workarounds were, and they've taken steps to try and address some of those weaknesses. I personally think they've bitten off a really big nut. I think they've tried to, to do a lot with one piece of legislation and, and it's may trip itself up in a few places. I just don't want us or our clients crushed in the process, so we need to do what we can. Once we know what we're doing, then it's time to start cleaning up our collection practices. When the law comes into effect, you will have a window of three years to get the contacts that you have now explicit permission. But the window for cleaning up your practices and your processes could be as short as three months. Well, has anybody tried ever to implement organizational change in a three month window? It's optimistic. It doesn't matter how big or small your organization is. You know, if you're a big organization, you're turning an elephant. How, how do you stop an elephant? If you're a small organization, how do you find the time? I mean, there, there really isn't much of a happy medium. You might be able to turn the small organization, but there are 24 hours in the day, and <clears throat> I've submitted to God for the 36-hour day every year for 10 years, and, and he's ignoring me. 24 hours, that's all we get. So it's tough, right? That's not a big window to make a massive change. So start now. Start cleaning up your practices now. Start talking to your people now. So you can't grandfather lists in that you've been using for a couple of years, and you know they're reliable lists, and... Because basically, I, mean, I have very large lists of, of contacts that I use for email marketing. That's a mix of you know current customers and things like that, but also contacts that we've met in trade shows and through advertising leads and things like that. You haven't probably haven't opted in. So, so do we have to put them all through a meat grinder and get them all to opt in in three years' time? Yes. Because that's gonna, I can't. That's gonna really. Yes. Short answer. Plans. Yes, you have three. You you, you can grandfather them for 36 months. 36 months from the date that the, the law comes into force. So if we start now, and the law doesn't come into force until December 2013, you buy yourself another 12 months. You get 48, not 36. I mean, you don't buy yourself a deadline extension, but you've got a better shot at getting more of those people organized. And I'd argue, realistically, if in 48 months you can't get somebody to opt in, they really don't want to hear from you anyway. And so you probably save yourself some money by getting them off your so list. We would kind of mm -hmm. kill all list brokers who sell lists, right, for segmented lists, that would kill a lot of their business. Because um, if I go and buy a list off someone, that's, they haven't opted in to receive anything. Well, first of all, if you buy a list from someone and they hand you the list, that should be a huge red flag. That should be a huge red flag right there. If, if you're renting a list from me and I hand you that list, right there we're breaking the law. Because you're right, they haven't opted in, and even can spam. When, when you're renting from a list broker that's following best practices and, and, and following kind of the, the legislation that's out there in other countries, you give them the message, they distribute it on your behalf, and they send you back the results. You don't actually ever get your hands on the database. So that, that is already a red flag. We encourage our clients not to use lists like that. Um, what you want is you want a, a, a 
service that's going to send a message on your behalf because their lists have opted in to receive partner communication through the broker. That would be allowed in the states though, not the CAT scan. No. No? No, it's not. Because you have your email address and you can... Yeah, it's in one of those niggly little gray areas, no. but yeah, there, there, are, there are other components. For example, electronic harvesting of an email address is outlawed. So you can't just go out and harvest email addresses off websites. And as a practice to build a list, that's not okay, even though you've just published it. But you can't, you can't electronically harvest the email address. And both CAN-SPAM and the CASL have that same requirement of not harvesting the addresses. So it's th that list brokerage industry is going to have to change because they have been kind of skating around some best practices, absolutely. But for the most part, with a reputable broker, you, you don't actually get your hands on, on the email address. You, you have a one-time use policy for it. Um, so that's, I mean, clean up, clean up our collection practices. And then once we've done that, we need to develop a compliance policy. And that's that protecting our personal liability, <coughs> right? We need to have a policy in place that specifies how we expect our teams, our employees, our agents to behave. How we expect them to execute and implement CASL and how we expect them to honor it. That compliance policy needs to also address how we expect our partners and any third party companies that we work with to behave around the new law. Do you guys remember uh, when PIPITA, the, the privacy law came into place? and the lawyers were all running around and we all had to sign data privacy agreements that we would protect privacy. Similar kind of thing is going to happen when this law comes out that we'll need to be signing uh, CASL compliance agreements or there will be a CASL compliance statement embedded into the agreement. I mean, we will be reaching out to all of our clients and asking them to sign a statement that lets us know that they are moving in place, that the list they provided us are CASL compliant, that blah, 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 processes that they will provide us an updated list so that we've taken the step of asking the questions and making sure that they're aware um, before the law comes into play. So those are the three things that businesses should be doing right now. And when you're thinking about your compliance policy, think also about your privacy policy. When was the last time it was updated? Think about terms and conditions on your website if you do e-commerce? What are the terms and conditions around your e-commerce transactions? Um, there. W what are the contracts with your vendors? What kind of training is required for your employees? What kind of access restrictions are required for employees to prevent a security breach, to prevent a breach of, of trust? Which is really what it comes down to. I mean, if, if an employee were to to breach CASL, there's a certain breach of trust there with if you've established, hey, we're, you know, we gotta follow this law. Um, take, for example, a scenario where a receptionist who doesn't require access to your database in the course of her job is doing a little Amway business on the side, and she sends an e-blast through your system to customers that she has communication with on a day-to-day -day business basis, outside of office hours, inviting them to check out her little Amway website. And it's, it's you know, not, not a completely far-fetched scenario. Bad judgment? Absolutely. But not unheard of kind of a scenario where people will reach out to clients and customers. Well, that's a commercial electronic message that's been sent to your list and it's unsolicited. Who's liable? The answer, I don't know. But those are the kinds of situations that we can see companies getting themselves into or finding themselves in and going, ugh, and now you're before the CRTC trying to justify um, or prove that you're doing best practices. So training is important, access to systems is important, all of, all of that kind of thing is important. I also encourage you, you know, this is available to download from our website. Um, and yes, by downloading it, you are up to end. But if you, you know, know other business owners that you think might benefit, I encourage you, we've given you the links there, please share it and invite them to download the information.
And if any of you have any questions uh, or you want to follow up, feel free to give me a call or, as I said, connect with me on, on LinkedIn or check us out on Facebook or Twitter.